Praise the Lord. We are gathered here tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. To praise and worship his name. I'm so glad that I'm able to come into the house of the Lord one more time. <laughs> I was sitting there kind of meditating on the scripture I'm getting ready to read, but um, praise the Lord. My prayer is that there would be no division, no isms or schisms found in the house of the Lord. Among the brothers and the sisters, we are family. Praise the Lord. Jesus prayed in John 17. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee that they may also be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. His prayer was to make us one. May I have a little more? Thank you. Make us one, Lord. Make us one. Make us one, Lord. Please make us one. Make us one. By your spirit, make us one. As you, Father, are with your Son, we pray today, please make us one. Make us one, Lord, by your spirit. Make us one Make us one, Lord Please make us one Make us one, Lord Please make us one Make us one by your spirit, make us one. As you, Father, are with your Son, we pray, please make us one. Make us one, Lord, by your spirit. Make us one. You prayed to make them one, Lord. To make them one. So we pray today, make us one, Lord. Please make us one. Make us one by. 
make us one as you father all with your son lord we pray today please please make us one make us one lord by your spirit make us one <laughs> make us one lord only you can do it, Jesus. <laughs> Please make us one. Tie us together with unbreakable cords of love. Make us one, Lord. Oh, we pray. Make us one by your Spirit, Lord. one Lord make us one do it by your spirit by your spirit make us one and as you father are with your son we pray today Lord Make us all one, make us one, Lord. Make us one, make us one. Oh, make us one, Lord. Answer the prayer, Father, your Son made. Oh, to make us one, Lord. Make us one. <laughs> Make us one, Lord. <laughs> Black, brown, white, yellow, red, it doesn't matter, Lord. Make us one, Lord. <laughs> Please make us one. Make us one, Lord. Make us one, Lord. You know, as my wife reads the scriptures, it was like this. It says here in John 17, 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. What makes us one is not our skin color, our position, our money, our title, where we live, where we don't live, where we go to church, it's the glory that manifests in our midst that makes us one. It supersedes everything that can possibly stop us from being one. When the glory manifests, it takes the differences between us, the oddness and the strangeness, the dislikes and the likes and the things we do not enjoy, and he comes and makes us and combines us unto one. The greatest threat of the enemy is the oneness of the church. His greatest fear is for us to be one. For it's in the unity of the body that the victory is won. It's not in our division. For the devil comes to divide and conquer. How he conquer is for us to divide. Our weakness is when we divide. Oh, it doesn't mean that we agree with every dot and every tittle and every comma, 
but we come together and we unite in one mind. And that one mind is Christ Jesus. And that one body of Christ supersedes anything outside of that body. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, one thing I have learned from being here, and I had to learn this the hard way, praise the Lord. I had one time someone come up to me and ask the question, how did you do it? I said, how do I do what? How did you make it? Culturally wise, it's totally different. I said, yes, it is. But the thing that made the difference is I had to learn to die. Hmm, praise the Lord. <laughs> I had to learn to die to many things to stay here, to even be here. Oh, praise the Lord. See, there's always at death, there's a resurrection. When you resurrect, you don't come up the same way you went down. You come up different. See, the only thing that can make you get up is the spirit. Only his spirit can make you rise again. So whatever killed you that brought you to your death, amen. Because there comes the third day when the rock is rolled away and he calls your name and it's time for you to get up from what every opinion, every attitude, every disposition, everything that hates you, everything that doesn't like you, everything that doesn't approve you, because it doesn't determine if you get up. It's God Almighty. And in spite of people's opinions, you rise. It's in this glory that we become one. You don't have to conform to me, and I don't have to conform to you. <laughs> That's a very true statement. There are things I like, you don't like, and vice versa. But that's not what makes us one. It's the glory of God, the same glory the Father gave the Son to make the Father and the Son one. He has given to his body that we may be one. <laughs> Pastor asked me to minister on a subject matter coming out of 2 Corinthians. Let me turn it real quickly. Uh, chapter 5, 17 to um, 19. No, 820, excuse me. And in this scripture, I told pastor, I sent him a text. I said, this is the scripture God has given me as a foundation of what I do and what I don't do. From where all my ministry comes from concerning him, it comes out of these scriptures. He gave it to me before I came. I didn't know how much I would need it. It's to be able to walk in the freedoms. I'm going to give a little bit of my testimony, but I'll get right to the meat of the matter because he wants me to talk about reconciliation. My life has been a life of reconciliation. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to start with. I never do. I have to sit there and pray. <laughs> Ask God to help me. I don't know what I'm going to say. I tell my wife, pray for me. There's nothing don't spill out of my mouth that don't need to come out. Praise the Lord. I said, because this is what is really real to me. You know, uh, it was a word given to me at in, in Thanksgiving. Uh, someone who I never expected to hear from gave me a call and began to talk to me. And they began to instruct me in this man. He said, when you were younger, there were many things that had come by the devil to purposely turn your heart that you would not be able to stand where you are today because of the choices you made yesterday. But the enemy sent these things purposely to hurt you and to damage you. So you become mad and angry and resentful and you wouldn't move into the things God has called you to do because whites had hurt you so badly. <laughs> oh, let me give you an example. I don't know what well, you probably don't know. The experience as I was age 10, me and my mother was traveling across Georgia to Alabama. And as we were going, we ran into this group of people dressed in white sheets, burning a cross. 
with a Confederate flag in their hand, with a rope in their hand, wanting to hang us and kill us. I was 10 years old then. Thank God for the bus driver, he's white. He wouldn't open the door as they came forward. Looking in the vehicle, wow, I'll never forget it. They were looking and the bus driver pushed me down and pushed my mother down. There were other people on the bus, but they never said a word. But the bus driver kept moving. Wow. There was nothing more frightening than to see those white sheets. Because I know with that Confederate flag, they came to kill me. There was no baby. That was my first encounter, not my last. But in that process, the enemy could have used it to divert me, to destroy me, to make me bitter, to make me resentful, to make me hateful. But God had another plan. <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> and I am thankful for this. We're in a time when pastor has said we're in two things, reconciliation and restoration. Two things I've had to live and experience and had to go through myself. He said the ministry of reconciliation has no limits and it doesn't. Reconciliation means to restore relationships the impossibility of a relationship being restored. Oh, praise the Lord. Can you imagine someone walking up to you and say they hate your guts? Can you imagine someone say, I'll never want to hear you speak again? Can you imagine someone walking up saying to you, da 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 da, and kept going, and then at the very end says these famous words, will you forgive me? Uh, very powerful words. I turned to the person and said, yes, I do. Oh, praise the Lord. But why? It wasn't because I didn't like what they said. Back in the day, I never started the fight, but I always made sure I finished it well. And as I was standing on my knees, I was praying when they came up to me. He wasn't much taller than me on my knees. In my back of my mind, I said, I can smash you to the ground. But in the spirit world, he said, you will forgive. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> well, I'm talking about reconciliation and restoration. See, when you give somebody, when you're dealing with somebody, and you're forgiving them, it ain't because they deserved it. Oh, because you understand one thing. You didn't deserve it. See, when you lose perspective of the fact that you didn't deserve it, how can you hold anything against anyone else? Oh, give me another one. I'm just going to give you some examples. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Help build my case. When I first got here, I was on the platform. Before I was on this, I was coming down. And I saw a group of people standing over there and one man was staring at me very hard. I thought for sure I was going to have to fight. I for sure because the way he was looking. As I got down the steps, he came to me from my side. I saw him. He said, excuse me, can I talk to you for a second? I said, sure. He said, we people, that's another word for in, believe that you people don't deserve to be on this platform. That was my exception coming to Whitehorse. And then he said the famous words. I call them famous words. Will you forgive me? <laughs> I laughed and chuckled. I said, boy, God, you really trying me. I said, yes, I will forgive you. Why? 
because I understand the fact my sins are many. And he was so merciful to forgive me. We talk about reconciliation because it's something forgiveness has to play in. And it has to play in very large. And you really don't know you're ready to deal with it until it hits you dead in your face. And it's something you don't like. It's something that you don't approve of. <laughs> That's another man asked me, he said, so let me ask you this, after all your experiences, he said, do you think it'll happen again? I said, for sure. I said, it'll happen before I get done talking to you. It's happened at Walmart. It happened in all the stores in this community. It's happened. But I'm not here because of that. <laughs> I'm here because he sent me. I'm here to help this ministry and to give whatever I can. It's not based on if someone likes me or don't like me. You sit there and you watch and you see me sitting there, but you don't even see what I see. You don't see the families that walk by and the husband jumps in front of me and prevents the children from touching me. You don't never see it, but it happens all the time. And what do I do? I forgive them. <laughs> this is where we're at. We're going to deal with reconciliation. He said, you can feel, the pastor said, you can feel the tension of the relationship. When it's there, you can feel the tension. You can feel the tensions even now in our communities. Further you get from mercy, the more judgmental you become. I refuse to forget how merciful God has been to me. How many times, how many times? I'm 67, I think now, praise the Lord. And the Bible says you get new mercy every morning. God is merciful. He gives me mercy before I even do something wrong. Because he knows I'm going to do something wrong. <laughs> so how can I not give the same mercy to someone else who at the moment didn't deserve it? But in God's eye, who has deserved it? Oh, help us, Lord God. Through Christ, God granted us reconciliation. The first thing I had to realize, my reconciliation to God had nothing of my own merits. It was nothing that I did that warranted me to have reconciliation with God. It was God who decided to give it to me freely. Not when I was thinking about him, but when I rejected him, didn't want nothing to do with him. He decided to come and die for me and reconcile me back to God. How can I hold anything against anyone? I don't have the right to, and neither do you. I've had people come at my office and they say, I refuse to forgive them and get up out of the chair and walk out. As they were leaving, I said, do you understand what you're doing to yourself? You are giving that person power over you for the rest of your life and for the devil to use that power to destroy your physical body over time. And I promise you, he will destroy it. They said, I do not care, I refuse. You're missing the point. You're looking at yourself and not at Christ. Your eyes is focused on your pain and your hurt. Let me say this real quickly. People tell you to forgive and forget. How do you do that? You ever thought about that? I have. I'm going to give you an answer. You usually remember, you know, like when a bee stings you and it throbs and it throbs and it throbs. That's the pain. You usually remember by the pain. But when Christ comes, he removes the stinger. 
and you start remembering by the pain and you start remembering by the victory of the moments. See, I knew when the pain came and I could say I forgive, there was no stinger. And so when I think of it, it's not pain. <laughs> I remember the victory. It was like when someone walks up to you, this has happened to me, there was a line and people were crawling. And me and my wife were standing looking at what's going on. And they were weeping because they said, my parents made their money off of slaves. And I want to come before you and ask you to forgive me. Forgive my family for the way we rudely treated you. I recognize whew, we were wrong. We made our money off of your backs. <laughs> I'm talking about a powerful God. See, you can't forgive something like that without recognizing the greatness of Jesus. Oh. Here he was stripped. They said his beard was pulled out that you couldn't tell he was a man any longer. The thorns was in his head an inch long, driven into his brain. His body was so cut open that you could see the blood vessels, the bones inside of him. As he bled, he was butt naked. He didn't have nothing on. He was stripped. Shame was there. Nakedness was there. And then the greatest thing, his heart was broken when his father forsaked him. How could I hold anything? How can I have the right to? <laughs> yes, it's wrong. But if you don't look in the mirror and you forget what kind of man you were, you will feel justified in holding your offense. Forgiveness frees you and frees others and calls restoration. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one another, tenderhearted. Listen to this. Forgiving one another. Why? Even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. Ephesians 4.30.31, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Our tongue is our problem. Oh, praise the Lord. Some things I've heard, some things I've seen, I would not say, I would not speak such. I would rather keep my mouth shut until I can say it in a way that's edifying, that is not disrespectful. I'm going to tell you an incident of how powerful authority figure is. My mother is authority even though she's my mother, even though I'm in my position, she's still a living, she was a living authority over my life. So one day me and her were going back to the room and she started gesturing with me like she likes to do. And she started calling me a liar. Hmm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that was the wrong thing, but praise the Lord. I turned to her, I said, no, you. And as it was getting ready to come out of my mouth, the Holy Spirit began to check me. Oh, I was right, but I was wrong. Because she said, she's still an authority. And even though the authority is wrong, I didn't put you there to correct her. The Spirit convicted me so strongly for opening my mouth irreverently to my mother. 
I quickly turned to her and said, Mom, forgive me. I spoke out of turn. See, the scripture talks about our mouths. And then Ephesians 4, 29 said, let no commu co co uh, corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. We have to be careful, people. We have to be careful. It will cause our own demise. I like this one. January 1st, 2022 said, James God was hearing to me and my wife was listening. He said, God says, be careful in 2022 that you don't be caught up in the war of words. You have to be careful of your mouth in 2022, people. You got to be careful in what you say and what you don't say. 2021 is over, but 2022 will set a course according to your words that it will follow you and find you. You must be watchful so you don't fall into the enemy's trap in 2023. 2022 called scandalon, getting offended in the war of words. There's one thing I want to say. There's one thing I see Christians get taken out of. That's when you get offended. Because when you get offended, you move into your flesh. And when you get into your flesh, there's nothing right coming out of your mouth. I don't care how godly you think you are. When you get offended, the flesh moves forward. You begin to say anything and everything you want to say. It doesn't mean that you have to be a puppet. It doesn't mean that you cannot agree. But I'm talking about when you slander the person. When you begin to speak evil of the person. That's when we sin, people. Y'all okay? Y'all kind of quiet, not moving that much, but praise the Lord. See, we have to, your, <laughs> your greatest ability is your adaptability. God can use somebody, God can use somebody that knows how to pivot, who knows how to shift. In basketball, you have to learn how to pivot with that one foot and never travel. Yet move all around and never travel. You have to master your foot stayed in place, but you still were moving. Someone who is not married to what? See, what God is looking for is someone who's not married to the past, is not ready to move on to the full future. We need to know how to move into what God is doing now. This is what pastors say is a new thing. It's a new day. It's a now thing. God can use you if you understand the power of adaptability. Are you able to adapt? Because there are things that are coming that you have never seen before. I remember in my other church I was at, I told the men one time and that they are coming. They said, what do you mean they are coming? Hmm. The men who dress as women are coming. And we're going to have to face them. As I began to talk, we started our men's prayer at 6 a.m. We didn't get done to 3 p.m. that day because the men began to stand up and confess their homosexual activity and their fear of it. I said, you can't be afraid of it. They need just as much love as we do. Most men think it's going to catch on them. Most people, scared, most men are scared of it in the first place. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Most women are not. Praise the Lord. <laughs> men are. But I told them it's coming. We don't know what kind of, you know, pastor been telling us we got to love each other. We got to get ready to love them when they come. Well, who are the come that's coming? They're not going to fit your status quo. They're not going to speak your salary, your home, and what you used to. Are you able to move past what you see and love them still? <laughs> see, the church of living God is not optional. It is necess necessity. It's a necessity. The church of living God is essential. Huh. Can you see yourself? You cannot change until you really see yourself. I didn't start changing my heart until I began to see myself. And I wasn't looking in the eyes of people to determine how I look. I was looking at the measure rod of Christ. Before things can be restored, we first need to see what needs to be changed in us. 
All change in our life must proceed by recognition. You have to see something before you can change it. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself missing a mark? I have seen myself missing a mark. I've seen myself miss it. But thank God there is mercy for my God. Whew. And the same mercy he wants me to give to others. <laughs> Ooh, me and others want God to restore something Perhaps before rest restoration takes place, we, need, we, need, we are in need of recognizing the thing in our life that are broken, that needs fixing, uh, that we are unaware of and un don't recognize. You cannot change what you cannot see. The big question is this. Think about this. Ask yourself this. What is it like to be on the other side of you? How would people around you define you? Will they define you as you define you? Because most of the time we say, oh, I don't have no problems. I'm a wonderful father. I'm a wonderful mother. I'm a wonderful brother. I'm the greatest worker you ever could find. And there are people in the head shaking their head like, whew, praise the Lord, they don't know. <laughs> because we all, we, all, we all have blind spots. So this is the only thing we don't have perspective on. You don't know what it is like to be on the other side of you because you cannot see yourself. <laughs> you must ask God to show you so you can see what's broken in you so you don't spend your entire life looking at what's wrong with everyone else but don't take the time to address the things that are wrong with yourself. See, I began to realize when I began to point the finger, there was three fingers back at me. And I finally started to realize to examine the three fingers. So I went through three church splits. And during those three church splits, I was pointing the finger. I was making them fault, but I began to realize over time it was me, oh Lord. It was me, oh Lord. Oh, things were done wrong, but I did not have the right to attack. Oh, praise the Lord. It was dangerous. See, when I attacked each place, I had to go back. Oh, praise the Lord. I had to go back. I had to pay the money to fly back to where I was to go to the pastor's house, to personally ask the pastor, oh, I'm talking to you real, to ask the pastor to forgive me for, blank, for using my mouth to curse, to damn her and the ministry. I went back again. This time I took my wife. I went around the church and counseled every curse word against the ministry that I spoke. At this time, I took my, one of my best friends in the split and I asked the pastor, can I come and stand before the church and ask them to forgive him because I was born in the first, found, the first foundation. She said, you didn't have to. I said, oh, yes, I do have to. I got before the church, humbled myself. My wife was there and asked them to forgive us for every word that we spoke. Oh, y'all don't understand. You will give account to God for every word. I don't care who don't hear you. God hears you. Every word you speak against things. You have to be careful. This is a great question. Like the Pharisees, who were real good at examining everyone else's problems? But they could not see what was wrong with themselves. The Pharisees were very good at microscopes. microscopes. They, they, were, they could examine you to the last detail. But the big question was, they couldn't see themselves. They never looked in the mirror. Have you looked in the mirror lately? Okay, praise the Lord. Y'all like y'all excited? Okay. You know... You know you're a Pharisee when all you talk about is, I see. So is it fair, I see? Okay. 
The Pharisees could not see themselves, but Jesus had the ability to make them see themselves. Another question which I had to ask myself was this, oh, could I be a Pharisee? The greatest deception is in your own self. Before someone else can deceive you, you must first be deceived with yourself. The only reason why they can deceive you from the outside is because you've already been deceived from the inside. I would have gave you the scriptures, but I have time for it right now. But that's a major question, isn't it? Is all you see is everybody's wrong? Then you need to check yourself and look into the mirror. See, coming to the end here. Reconciliation. The kingdom-minded churches are those that hold the great the gospel of Jesus Christ in the highest esteem while pursuing these things, justice, restoration, and reconciliation. We're about reconciling, and this is the hour of reconciliation like never before. But the greatest danger is our own selves. How do you see you in light of his word? Reconciliation has to do with relationship and fellowship. It has to do with the removal of hostility and the entering into relationship. It means there has been a healing in the relationship. So those that were in alienation against one another can now have a harmonious relationship. This is what we're after. This is what we're looking for. There's been too many breaches of relationship in this time, in the last year and a half, two years, over and over, too many has happened. It is the presence of sin. Sin has alienated mankind from God. Men are not reconciled to God because of sin. Reconciliation is God's work through the death of Christ by which sinners are brought back into spiritual fellowship and harmony with God. In other words, it's something God did without your permission or mine. He did it so we can come back to him, so we can be in fellowship with him. It is so important that we are. It is a movement from alienation until restoration. There are three dimensions in reconciliation. Three ways reconciliation occurs. Three relationships are in fact reconciled by the word and be what it represents. First, there's the vertical. This is the main one you have to keep in mind. That's what I was talking about. The vertical one is the most important because as I deal with those that hurt me, or those that disappoint me, those that backstab me, those that lie on me, those that pretend to be my friend but are not my friend, I have to have a vertical look eyesight first to be able to handle the horizontal. If you lose the vertical, you will become fleshly in the horizontal you will become carnal and you will strike back with the same method and no one wins. Ooh, hallelujah. All reconciliation starts there. We find the scriptures that God has reconciled us Christians to himself by means of the death of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given what first? us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave me the ministry of reconciliation through the understanding of what God did through Christ that made it possible that I now can be in fellowship with my God, not based on my merits, not based on my performance, but based on the finished work of Calvary. And I have accepted that work and I can go before him in the name of Jesus to receive my connection back to my God. <laughs> and I'm supposed to tell others we have been reconciled to God, but it also has been provided, says the scripture, there's a bigger than that. It's bigger than that. Even the world has been reconciled to God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19, the next verse, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. This is a very important statement. What he's telling you is God's not angry no more. God releases anger on his son. 
When are you going to release your anger? When are you going to let your anger go? Yeah, they were wrong in what they did. It wasn't right. But when are you going to let your anger go? God says here, not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto them, unto us, the word of reconciliation. God's anger was dealt with on the cross when he stripped his son. When is your anger going to be settled? When are you going to let it go? Whew, hallelujah. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. He's given us the ministry. He's also given us the word. And he also gives us a message of reconciliation as well. Be thou reconciled to God. Why? Because if you're going to handle the horizontal, you got to be vertical. Because the horizontal is going to bring a lot of evil, a lot of wrong. And it's going to hurt. You have to keep your eyes on the vertical and see this. What, this is what you got to see. I didn't deserve it. <laughs> and how many times have I done the same sin and didn't deserve it? And yet, he forgave me every time. So how can I hold anything against my sisters? How could I hold anything against my brother? But see, you got to look vertical. You got to look up and see your own answer. Just give me two minutes here. Wow. <laughs> Through this universal reconciliation, the whole world has been made savable, possible. There is no one in the world that cannot be saved because of what God did was reconcile the world as a unit unto himself. The amazing thing is with reconciliation, you can forgive, but it does not mean you always get reconciliation. God forgave us on the cross. He, he died. He took the punishment so we can be forgiven. But the reconciliation, you have to decide if you're going to be in relationship. You're going to be in family. You're going to be in fellowship. This is a different world for us. Praise the Lord. I got to get ready to stop. This is a universal reconciliation that provides, that, that is provided there is an actually reconciliation that is experienced. Even though God has reconciled the world to himself, all the world is not saved. And the reason why the whole world is not saved is because all the world does not accept the reconciliation that has been provided by the work of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ did, be ye reconciled to God. Those three scriptures are the scriptures that God gave me before I came here and I had to live by them because I had to keep my eyes on the head on Christ. Because see, out of Christ comes grace. Out of Christ comes truth. Out of Christ comes faith. It comes all the things I need to be what I need to be at the moment. It gives you the ability to forgive the unforgivable. Look, husbands and wives, we need to be looking up unto the head. Because he's the only one that can give you the ability to let the offense go. I'll end with this, I'm not done, but anyway, praise the Lord. God is interested in this. He wants to keep you vertical. So your horizon can be family, can be love, that can be peace, that can be forgiven, that can be support. This is what he's after. 
How many times in one day do you forgive somebody? Seven times 70 for the same offense. How much more does he forgive? How many times have you gone up? I've, sometimes I've gone up many times the same thing. And you know something? He never has rejected me. So I ask you today, will you let it go? Will you let go of the person that hurt you? Will you let go of the person that damaged you? They were 100% wrong in what they did. But you're not right because you didn't do it. Because you have sins that Jesus had to take care of too. It's time to let go. Let's give the Lord a hand praise, please. <laughs> we serve an awesome God. You're supposed to hear a song, right? Praise the Lord. Okay. We'll play a song here. <laughs> Help us, Lord. opportunity to come to the altar. I know there's things out there and I know there's things you have to deal with. But the altar is our place that God meets us. He desires us to come. It may be your co-worker. It may be your mom. Maybe your dad. I deal with so many people that moms and dads have hurt so badly that they cannot go on. But I just say to you, when you become a mom and dad, you'll realize how imperfect you are. <laughs> and how many times you missed it as well. <laughs> but come. Come to the altar as the Lord draws you. Don't stay in your chair. Wow. He wants to bring unity back to you. He wants you to come to him. He loves you. Going to the altar is not a beating. It's not a put down. It's him restoring. It's him restoring. So I just say come to you as they continue to sing. The altar is open. As we come to the conclusion of our service, hey, thank you for joining us, being online with us. We so enjoy you being a part in our relationship being a part of what God is doing. We consider it an honor. We thank the Lord has given us opportunity to share what's happening here at Whitehorse with all of you wherever you are. I want to encourage you and remind you, if you would like to give, there are different ways to give. You can give online, whcc.net. You can give by phone by calling the church, 765-477-1111. Or you can come by and give in person. Your giving helps us maintain, sustain, and continue the work of the gospel and reaching out to the nations. Be sure to tithe your local church. Be a blessing to your pastors, your elders, and your leaders. Send your testimonies to us, please. We love to hear your testimonies and share them. My testimony at whcc.net. Be sure to pray with one another as we've come to conclusion. Let the theme of the message today and what Holy Spirit is doing be joined with faith that you might move forward in the power of the Holy Spirit and be blessed. Thank you for our relationship. Thanks for all you've done to help us carry out the vision. God bless you.